Good evening. Welcome to worship at St. Paul's. It's good to gather around God's Word with you. We're in the season of Lent, and we're starting up a new series on the weekends, where we're going to be looking at the Old Testament lesson and seeing how throughout time our God is a God who rescues his people. We're going to be looking at the rescue and how God rescues on a personal scale and on a national scale and on a universal scale. We see a picture of that in the life of David and Goliath this evening. We're going to be using a special um, confession of sins as well during the season of Lent, where we'll use Martin Luther's hymn in hopelessness and near despair, so that'll be coming soon. But our opening hymn today we'll sing together is, Lord, Take My Hand and Lead Me. The words will be on the screen, and they're also in the blue hymnals in front of you. God bless you as we worship together. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If, if we, we confess, confess our, our sins, sins God, God is faithful, faithful and just, and, and will forgive us our sins, sins and, and purify us from all unrighteousness. unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord.
are sure that our God loves us. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. strength, the battle of good and evil rages within and around us, and our ancient foe tempts us with his deceits and empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word, and when we fall, raise us up again and restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. first scripture reading for today will also be our sermon text. I won't read all of it again then. It's a familiar story, a story of God rescuing his people through his young servant, David, from 1 Samuel chapter 17. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was strung across his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man, and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man, and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. David said to Saul, 
Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I'll give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our script, second scripture lesson is from the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 4, beginning with verse 14. In just a moment, we'll read the gospel lesson, which shows Jesus being tempted on the battlefield with Satan, and he's tempted. And throughout his entire life, he's tempted, just as we are in every way, so that he can resist that temptation and save us and give us the victory. We see this in Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We hear the special gospel acclamation for the season of Lent from our campus. rise out of love for the words and works of Jesus recorded in the gospel. The gospel appointed for the first Sunday of Lent is from Luke chapter 4 beginning with verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, 
left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully, so they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for our sermon hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. In the blue hymnals, you can find it on hymn 864.
grace and peace are yours from our Lord, our Savior, our victorious champion, Jesus Christ. Amen. The battle lines were drawn up. The, the armies were facing off against each other. The unbeatable enemy was advancing and taunting. Day after day, he emerged into the, the valley and began cursing God, tempting and taunting the Israelite army. Goliath, a mountain of a man, a giant. He's, he's nine and a half feet tall. He's probably carrying at least 200 pounds of armor. He's holding a spear that has to be taller than he is with a tip that's 15 pounds. For 40 days in a row, he enters and he yells and he curses God and the Israelites. He's taunting them. Face me. Send one. Send one of your best. A one-on-one -on -one fight, man to man. If you win, we'll be your slaves. But when I win, you'll serve us. If anyone should attempt to fight Goliath from the Israelite army, it should be King Saul. Do you remember that he stands a head taller than everybody else around him? He is the king of Israel, but he's not going in. <laughs> One day an unlikely champion arrives. His name, you know, is David. He's a shepherd boy. He's a young man. He's the youngest of eight when his father tells him to go and bring some food and supplies to the army and to his three brothers who are old enough to be out there in the battle. So he leaves his, his shepherding back in a town we know well, in the town of Bethlehem, and he goes to see what's going on. And then he sees Goliath come out and do his usual taunting, his defying of the army of Israel and the name of the Lord. And he sees him and he listens and he starts to ask some questions. What, what is going on here? What's, what's he asking for? What's, what's going on? What's the challenge? And he finds out the challenge, a one-on-one -on -one fight for the entire army, for supremacy. And he essentially says, what? That's all? We just, we just need to have one of our guys go out and fight him and kill him? I'll do that. <laughs> because he knew. We've got the Lord, the living God, on our side. And he does not have a God of any kind on his side. It's not even a fair fight for him. Send me out there. And we might think, I'm sure his older brothers thought at this point, oh, no. <laughs> no, Dave, no, don't do it. What are you thinking? You're going to get yourself killed. What's this attitude? But he's not being foolish. He's seen God's hand at work before. Uh, when people question him, he says, no, I've, God has rescued me from horrible things already. When I've been out protecting and shepherding and taking care of my father's sheep, in the past, a lion has come and a bear has come, and God's given me the victory against them too. And when they tried to kill me, I grabbed them by the fur and, and killed them. The God who rescued me from the most powerful predators you can think of is also going to rescue us from this giant, from this unbeatable champion. We have the Lord on our side. David would then go out to the Philistine. He would go out and he wouldn't wear Saul's armor. He wouldn't take any of that. Instead, he would just wear his shepherd clothing. He'd have his staff and his shepherd sling. And he would go out to them, go out to, to the Philistine, to Goliath. And he said, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, a throwing spear. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. That's confidence. It's not self-confidence though. 
David isn't particularly confident in his own abilities. That's not what he says with his words. He has confidence in the Lord. The Lord will deliver us from your hand. The Lord will deliver you into my hand. He predicts that God is going to give him this victory. He is going to slay him, and he's going to cut off his head. And David, remember, isn't even holding a sword. He has the Lord on his side. So David goes to the, the dry creek bed and chooses five smooth stones. I guess I always picture these as, as kind of small stones, pebbles, maybe a bullet coming out. Archaeologists have found the sling stones. It doesn't tell us the size of these. Um, a common size for sling stones at this time in history are about the size of a billiard ball or a tennis ball, so maybe a little bit bigger and heftier than we're used to thinking. And he takes them, and he takes five. We'll see that he's only going to need one. But God doesn't tell him it's going to be a one-shot kill. <laughs> he comes, he, he fills up his bag, he's got his ammunition ready, and then the sling, so don't think of, don't think of a Y-shaped pullback on a rubber band kind of a sling, but two leather cords that connect to a leather pouch. You've got an a artist's picture of kind of what it would look like on the front of the bulletin. And then it, it swings around, you let go of one of the cords, hang on to the other one, it opens up and boom, shoots out. You can watch YouTube videos of this and see people using the shepherd's sling nowadays. I really thought about buying one on Amazon and shooting some marshmallows into the, into the <laughs> congregation today, but I, I didn't. Um, but I, I've, I've seen that people can today make these go 60 miles an hour. So it's, it's a decent weapon. <laughs> but he has the Lord on his side, and he goes out. He steps up to the battle line, and with his one stone, he takes him out. A shot to the head, and he falls to the ground. And God rescues his people from their enemies through young David. This unlikely hero rescues the nation. Now what kind of an application can we make from this? Really, a preacher can, and some do, go in all kinds of directions from this point. The danger is that we begin to see David as the hero of the story, instead of the Lord. And that's not why, where the Bible writers want us to go. The moral of the story could easily start to be all about how God's going to do the impossible through me. David and Goliath can digress into a pep talk about how, how we should have courage to overcome all of our obstacles. A few weeks ago when I was starting to study for this sermon, I, I looked up some podcasts and some books just using the search term David and Goliath. And yes, I found um, sermons and, and children's stories that I could read, watch, and listen to. But I also found things like this. Five keys to job promotion through the eyes of David and Goliath. I found podcasts about insurance sales and inspirational thoughts about overcoming the giants in your life. Sometimes the giant was even a big corporation. I didn't spend a whole lot of time looking into these. I spent more time in, in the Bible. <laughs> The point of the story is not David defeated an impossible enemy because he had such a strong faith. And now here's five simple steps so that you can be just like David. The story is not a call to have more courage when life is hard. This is a picture of God doing what God does best, rescuing his people. God is the hero. That's, that's the story of the Bible. The people are not the heroes in the Bible. And, and if you read in the Old Testament for a little while, that becomes very clear very quickly. And it's kind of hard to read some of those sections because it's just like, oh, people are bad. God is so good and he's so patient and he's so rescuing. People in the Bible are not the hero. And with a little bit of introspection in our own lives, we can hopefully see pretty quickly that we're not the hero of our story either. And the Bible isn't a self-help book so that we can become the hero. Yet where do we look for rescue? <laughs> Anywhere other than God sometimes. The Israelites would often look to rescue from their king. Do you find yourself sometimes trusting and relying on the government, the politicians, the policies, 
to be able to change the world or find your security? Do you look to your job, your insurance, your income, or your intellect to find rescue? Do you see a need for a rescuer even as a sign of weakness? Because overall, you can probably handle things on your own. You're doing just fine. We're not okay on our own, though. That's a lie that Satan would love to tell us, that we can be our own hero, that we can be our own savior. Think about the enemy that we have. He's not a giant with a spear. He's an evil angel who wants to twist God's word and drag us away from him and into hell forever. He can't read our thoughts, but he can observe our behaviors, and he's been observing humanity for a long time to just know where to whisper and where to tempt and where to turn us away. He knows our weaknesses. How well do you do at avoiding those temptations of Satan? How long until you give in to weakness again? How often do we say, how how could God expect such high standards anyway? It's his fault. The enemy strikes again and again. We need rescue. This is the rescue. God steps in. And God rescues his people from their enemies and from themselves, from ourselves. We're not the heroes. David wouldn't be the hero forever. We'll see him fall into sin soon enough. The Bible is a story of a rescuing God who would not give up. Here we see rescue on all different scales. We see personal rescue. As, as God rescues this young man who goes up against an impossible um, murdering threat. He rescues him. We see national rescue as God would allow the Israelites to win this battle against their enemies, the Philistines. And we see cosmic rescue. Because David the shepherd from the town of Bethlehem is a picture of another rescuer. A picture of another another person who would go into battle. About a thousand years later, another shepherd, the good shepherd, steps out into the wilderness. For 40 days and much more than that, the enemy had been coming up to the battle lines. The unbeatable enemy was advancing, and day after day he had emerged, taunting God, testing, tempting, terrifying God's people, picking them off, and leading them to hell one by one. How could they, how could we stand against an enemy like this, against an enemy like Satan that's called, that's called the father of lies, the ancient serpent, the prowling lion searching for someone to devour? We couldn't stand up one-on-one, man-to-man. To him, not a chance. But another champion takes the field. Do you recognize what's happening in the gospel lesson today? In the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, when the devil comes and tempts him after 40 days of real, true human weakness, this is Jesus entering our battle on our behalf. This is Jesus coming and and tagging in and saying, I've got this. (laughs) Go to the sideline. And Jesus steps in. This is God entering the battlefield, but it is also man. This is our human brother standing as a human in our place. There's the lion, growling, hoping to finally defeat God and all of mankind. So this ancient serpent whispers lies. He pulls out all the stops against Jesus for his entire life and especially here in our gospel lesson. He offers power. He twists God's word. He plays on Jesus' hunger and his human natural weakness. But for us fights the valiant one whom God himself elected. And do what they will, hate, steal, hurt, or kill. They can harm us none. The victory has been won. He, Jesus, holds the field forever. 
Jesus battling in the wilderness is not just a Sunday school story that we nod our heads along with. Jesus is going into the battle for us one-on-one, -on -one, and if he wins and continues to win against every temptation of the evil one, then you have won too. In theology, we sometimes call this the active obedience of Christ. That Jesus actively lived a holy and righteous life, standing against all temptation in your place, and then he gives you his righteousness as a gift. He credits it to your account so that God looks at you and he sees not just Jesus' death in your place, but Jesus' holy, perfect life in your place. In the epistle lesson from Hebrews, we saw that Jesus had to be like his brothers in every way. He had to be a human just like we were so that he could endure temptation, the same temptations that we did. Only he never fell into temptation. He won that battle here on the battlefield with Satan in every single day of his life. And now his perfect life counts for you. And he finally won that battle at the cross and at the empty tomb where he crushes that ancient serpent's head and proves that he is our champion and the champion of the world. The lion is, is defeated, he's injured, but he's, he's still trying. <laughs> he's still fighting, trying to drag as many down with him, still searching for souls to devour, trying to snatch you from the flock. But you've won the battle through Christ. And Jesus says, no one can snatch you from my hand. Amen. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Amen. Please rise as we confess our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed, printed on page 7 and on the screen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Included in our prayers today, we have prayers for uh, the family of Renee Regenscheid and Pat Ruther. Her, their sister, Jan, passed away on the 3rd from cancer. And we, now we, we ask that the Lord keep those, those who are left and who mourn in his arms. And then also for our member, Rosie Banks, her husband, John, it seems like the Lord is going to call him to be with him in heaven soon. So we pray for that family as well. We bring our prayers to the Lord using the prayer of the church on page 8. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Grant, Grant your word in our hearts and, and cause it to be Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. 
Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all those who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may rule in justice and in their evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity, especially John Banks. Remember those who suffer persecution for their faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant your love and give them Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest for their labors. Lord, we especially bring before you Jan, and we pray that you would comfort her family and all who mourn her death with your precious promises. Cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest and at last, together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. Amen. Congregation, you may be seated. We'll bring the offering forward at this time. In a moment, we'll continue with the sacrament portion of the service, and that will be, we'll follow the order of service as it starts on page 165, and there's sung parts in the hymnal, so you can open up to page 165, and then when it, when it gets to the Lord's Supper, we will serve first this side of the congregation and then this side. And we invite all who are confirmed members of our congregation or the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod to come forward or our sister synod, the Evangelical um, ELS or Wells, to come forward at that time. And if you're not yet a member of one of those church bodies, then I'd love to talk with you more after the service about how you could take one of our classes to learn more about what we believe and teach and join us in the future. So at this time, I'd invite you to please rise and we'll continue on page 165 with the preface. Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn be 
be overcome by a tree. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Thanks, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things, in him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us by your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith, so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
please rise. The true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it, you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face smile upon you and be merciful to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for coming tonight and worshiping at St. Paul's in the beginning of the season of Lent. If you are worshiping online with us tonight, thank you for doing that. Please fill out the online connection card on our website at stpaulsnorthmankato.com. If, if you're watching online and you haven't been able to come and make it to the Lord's Supper, know that um, the Tuesday between the first and second Sunday of each month when we have communion, so this coming Tuesday at 1 o'clock, we'll have small group communion here at church, and we'd love for you to come there if you haven't been able to make it in person. And perhaps you know people that are in that situation where they haven't quite felt comfortable coming back yet. Please let them know about that, encourage them, or even if we can just come over to their house and bring them the Lord's Supper, we'd sure love to be able to help people connect, stay connected to the Word and Sacraments. So uh, next week, we have another special guest preacher as we lead up to the 100th anniversary of St. Paul's. That is Professor Thomas Nass from Martin Luther College. He was a pastor here in the early 80s. So he'll be preaching next weekend coming up. Our Lent services have started up again. So um, every Wednesday now for the next handful of weeks, we'll have church at 4 o'clock and 6.30 with a free fellowship meal between the services. Easter for kids will come up after Lent and then, and then Easter proper also. But there's some opportunities for how you might help with Easter for kids. And on the connection card, there's some opportunities to sign up and say, I'd like to learn more about that, or I'd like to help with that. Some other opportunities on that card when you fill that out, too. Uh, one thing you could do is if you can donate some Easter candy or something like that, we'll use, at the end we'll have an Easter egg hunt after sharing Jesus with all these kids. And then tomorrow will be a call meeting and we'll meet right after church, after the 10.30 service, uh, around 11.45. We'll get started as soon as we can and extend a call, uh, Lord willing, for a lead pastor and uh, a final Jesus Loves Me Learning Center teacher. So come and join us for that. Well, God be with you. Say hi to each other, but I look forward to saying hi to you on your way out. Thank you.